Good morning. My name is Patrick Lynette from the University of Southern California, and my talk will focus on tsunami hazards in ports and harbors. This animation that's playing in the background is a bit of foreshadowing that will lead some of our discussion later on in the talk. What it's showing is a large tsunami generated by an earthquake along the Puerto Rico trench just to the east of us here. As you look at this, what you see is reds represent positive elevation waves, crests of the waves, and the blues represent the troughs. Um, this animation shows you the typical behavior of a tsunami in that it starts as a very focused, highly energetic source and the wave energy disperses quite quickly as it radiates away from the source. So again, we'll talk more about this later um, when we can propagate these effects closer to the shoreline to some of the ports here on the island of the Dominican Republic. First, I would like to present an outline of the talk. Uh, so our focus here, our focus is on ports and harbors, and in particular, it's going to be on the currents generated by tsunamis. So, so our focus here is going to be on how fast the water moves. So very often when you think about tsunamis, you think about how high the water gets, how far inland it moves. But when we think about ports and harbors and, and these types of places where you have a lot of infrastructure in the water already, you have this potential for damage to occur without flooding. Um, and so this damage is forced by the current, and, and this is our motivation. Um, some of the things that we'll talk about here is we will develop current thresholds at which to expect different types of damage. We're going to generate maps showing the duration of damaging currents for different sources. Um, and we'll talk about some of the modeling method methodology and how we might extend this methodology for hazard assessment. But before we get into talking about developing the hazard maps and what types of information is contained in those hazard maps. First, let's introduce the tsunami hazard and let's talk about some observations of damage in ports and harbors. So on that first slide, I, I showed uh, an animation of a large tsunami from a magnitude 9 earthquake occurring along the Puerto Rico Trench. Here it is again with a slightly different view, a larger view, uh, but you can also see the color scale. So you can see the deepest reds here are about three meters in elevation and the deepest blues are about negative two meters in elevation. So that's two meters below the mean ocean level. And as this animation progresses, you can see those waves spread out and you can in particular see a pulse of that red energy, that positive energy pass through the gap between uh, the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. And then it wraps around the southern shore of the Dominican Republic and approaches Santo Domingo. So on the next slide, We'll zoom in to this area, and we will zoom into our area of interest here, which for this particular discussion will be the Rio Hena, and the port of Rio Hena. Um, and what I want to show in this animation is just the magnitude of scales that you have to deal with when you, when you try to understand tsunamis. So on the large scale, the propagation scale where the tsunami is generated, we have to deal with waves moving across large portions of the Atlantic Ocean. But when we're interested in the tsunami effects in an individual port, we have to shrink that down and look at resolutions on a scale of 10 meters or less. We're talking about many orders of magnitudes of scale that you have to pass through to understand the tsunami effects in coastal areas. On this slide, we see an animation of the simulation results for the port of Rio Hena. Um, you have three different plots here. So in the upper left, what you see is an animation of the ocean surface elevation. So the colors are telling you how high the water is, where the reds indicate high levels and the blues indicate relatively low levels. And all these are relative to the mean sea level. To the right, or the upper right, is where you see the current or the speed underneath that water. And that's going to be the one that we are going to focus on. The time series shown on the bottom of this animation is the ocean surface elevation offshore. So this is effectively what's driving the wave and the water as it tries to enter the port. And so this particular time series is at the 150 meter depth contour, which is deep for um, the types of problems we deal with on the coast, but it is quite close to the coast in this area due to the depth of the water. And so what you see in this elevation for this particular source is that the wave is quite large. This is a very large tsunami, this particular source. That first big pulse of energy, which arrives about one hour after the earthquake, has an amplitude greater than two meters 
followed by a series of waves with amplitudes of 2 meters and less. So looking to the animation of ocean surface elevation, what you see when you watch this is that near the river mouth, where the river exits into the ocean, because of the shoreline and the, the bathymetry and the topography, you have a fairly significant focus of energy here and quite a bit of inundation. In this area, you see maximum water levels uh, approaching 5 meters. Um, but what I want to show on this slide is really the motivation of this work, and that is the difference between the ocean surface elevation and the ocean currents. So in the ocean surface elevation, what you see is patterns that change, but they don't change that quickly in space and time. However, when you look at the ocean current on the right, what you see is a very spatially variable current field where currents can change um, very quickly and very short distances over very short times. Um, and what I also want to uh, draw your attention to when you look at these ocean current animations is these features that almost look like donuts where you have a ring of color um, and in the center of that ring you have that blue area indicating relatively low speeds. What these are, these are whirlpools or large eddies being generated by the flow. This is something that I'm going to talk about a little bit more later on in the talk. Um, but again, this motivation is just to show you that uh, there's a, these are two different beasts when we talk about tsunamis. Um, the first order problem is what you see on the left. It's the elevation. We need to know how far the water will go inland so that we can develop evacuation maps. We know where, where things will get flooded. But when we're focusing on ports and harbors, the most important piece of information for our assets that are already in the water are, are usually going to be the currents. And so this is, this is why we have to look at these ocean currents that you see over here on the right. It's why we have to understand where they will be amplified, where they will be relatively large, um, so that we can translate that, in, that information into design and mitigation to understand um, where we need to focus on, um, where we expect damage may be during tsunamis in ports and harbors. In terms of understanding the tsunami hazard in ports and harbors, first I would like to discuss some historical events, some recent and some not recent. Um, the first one I'll talk about occurred in 1867 in this area of the Caribbean, where there was a, a large earthquake occurred in the Lesser Antilles and caused very large tsunami in the area. Um, one very interesting record that we have comes from uh, an ad admiral in the U.S. Navy um, who was aboard one of the large ships in the port of St. Thomas. And he has this record noted in one of his logs of the formation of a very large whirlpool in the center of the bay, and it pulled lots of fro floating debris towards it. Um, we also have a an, an record from another ship during this event uh, from the U.S. DeSoto um, where that ship was caught in uh, one of these eddies and it was actually spun around 20 times um, in these waves until finally settling in the middle of this large spitting eddy in the, in the middle of the bay. Um, so this is a, a historical event in this area from a large tsunami and it just it gives you this idea of what happens in ports and harbors. So you had these large ships being caught on the currents, they couldn't really do much to control themselves and, and you have this record of spinning, this, this type of eddy, uh, rotational type of flow um, that, as you'll see as we go later on, something that we expect to be very common when we see tsunamis in ports and harbors. Next, we'll move more forward in time to 2004 to the Indian Ocean tsunami. Um, so, as I'm sure you're aware, this was generated by a very large earthquake uh, in the northern part of Sumatra. It propagated a wave across the Indian Ocean, affecting uh, Sri Lanka, India, all the way to Africa, to the west, and of course Thailand to the east. The areas I want to focus on in this particular discussion are shown by the stars. So we're going to look uh, in the far field first to Oman, to Reunion, and Madagascar. We'll focus on three ports in these areas. And then after we look at those areas, we'll shift back to the east and we'll, we'll look at um, some satellite images of currents just north of Sumatra. Moving first to the port of Salala in Oman, we have perhaps the most remarkable event of tsunami-induced currents in a major harbor. And this particular event was the event that, uh, when I learned about it, it really motivated me to try to understand these types of currents in ports and harbors during tsunami. Uh, 
Okay, so what you had in Salala during the event was you had uh, one of a, the large Maersk container ships, 285 meter long Maersk Mandrake, berthed um, at the most offshore berth inside the port of Salala. Well, when the first couple of waves came in, uh, there were not strong currents and no flooding and nothing was really observed. Uh, however, when the third and fourth waves came in, um, there happened to be very strong currents generated in this area and they were rotational. So effectively, there was a large eddy being generated off of the corner near where this boat was located. This caused a, a strong yaw in the ship and the mooring lines detached one by one, they sort of popped and pulled off. The ship was then caught in the currents. It was pulled out of the harbor at first, and amazingly, it was caught in an eddy right at the entrance to the harbor where it spun around in that area. So keep in mind here, this ship is almost 300 meters long. The width of that entrance is just over 500 meters long. So there's not a lot of clearance here as this ship is spinning around inside the port. The currents then pulled the Maersk outside of the harbor to the backside of the breakwater where it almost impacted in the breakwater but did not quite impact. The currents then pulled it all the way back around in the other direction where again it was caught in an eddy and was spun around. The currents then pulled it to the backside of the uh, container terminal where it finally beached on a sandbar. So as this was all happening, of course, the personnel on the port were not watching it idly. They had put tugs on the container ship to try to control it and keep it from spinning on the currents. But uh, these efforts um, did not help at all. And, and so what happens here is that these currents that are induced by the tsunami, they are changing so quickly in time and space that the tug can't react to these currents. And effectively, the tug could do nothing to keep this container ship from spinning on the currents. So you may come to the conclusion that the wave that caused this large ship to be pulled off its mooring lines was a very, very large wave. In fact, that was not the case. So what you have here on this slide is the recording from the tide gauge inside the port. The top signal shows the, the actual recording from the station which includes both the tsunami signal and the tide signal. The plot on the bottom shows the data with the tide signal removed so what you're seeing here is just the tsunami. Now the ship was pulled off its mooring lines at around this third wave and what you see here is that the amplitude of that wave was about a meter and a half. So it's a big wave but it's not a huge wave and in most places it's pretty close to the tidal range. So the point here is that um, very, very strong currents can be generated inside ports and harbors, even if the wave is not large. Next, we move to La Porte in Reunion. In this area, uh, another large container ship, a 200 meter container ship, the Uruguay, was pulled off its mooring lines. And here, as opposed to in Oman, where the ship was pulled outside the harbor, uh, the Uruguay was pulled inside the harbor. So this is significant now because once it gets pulled inside the harbor, you, ha you have this possibility where the ship can start banging into gantry cranes and causing a lot of secondary damage, which will then cause a much longer downtime in the port. And that is what happened here. So the container ship was pulled inside the harbor. It banged into a couple of gantry cranes, causing minor damage. And the interesting aspect here is that the port did manage to re-secure this ship and tied it back up to uh, its berth only to have the mooring lines part again three hours later. And so this is a, an interesting story in that not only do you have strong currents far away, but these currents can persist for many, many hours in ports and harbors because you get energy trapped inside ports and harbors because you get things like resonance in ports and harbors. You have these wave and current effects persisting for many hours during tsunami events. It's not a one wave and done. It's uh, a wave and then many, many more waves for many hours after. Here we have a relatively small ship, a 50 meter freighter in a uh, port in Madagascar. Uh, so here what happened was the ship parted its lines and uh, like in Reunion, the ship was carried inside the port on the currents where it impacted against the dock, causing minor damage to the dock. The currents then 
pull the ship back outside the port until it finally beached on a sandbar. As a final observation from the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, here is a satellite image taken uh, just north of the island of Sumatra. And I really like to show this video because it gives you the proper representation of what you need to think about when you think about nearshore and coastal currents generated by a tsunami. So it's somewhat easy and maybe even intuitive to think about a tsunami coming in, flooding the coast, and then receding and going back out, just like a wave you'd see on a straight beach. And that the currents associated with that flooding may more or less be straight flooding in and straight flooding out. Where in reality, it looks nothing like that. Because you have reg irregular shorelines with headlands and complex uh, shapes, all these complex shapes start to generate directional currents. And so after a while, what you get with tsunamis in the near shore is what you see in this image. It's a soup of eddies and whirlpools, currents going many different directions. It is completely chaotic. This shows you that you don't want to be in the coastal area. You don't want to be in the near shore trying to navigate through these currents. Because if these currents are strong, as they're so dynamic and chaotic, it's very, very difficult to navigate in this situation. Moving forward now to our most recent very large event, we look at the 2011 Japan tsunami. So as I'm sure you're well aware, this generated huge waves locally in Japan and propagated a very large wave throughout the Pacific, affecting nearly all the coastlines in the Pacific Basin. Along the coastlines of Japan, in the ports and harbors and marinas of Japan, there was widespread devastation. Uh, 350 ports suffered damage, uh, some catastrophic damage, and you had uh, more than 18,000 fishing boats out of operation. So Japan was, of course, devastated, as you would expect, because the wave was tremendous in this near field. But I don't want to discuss what happened in Japan. I want to look away from Japan to the far field. The area I would like to discuss is the uh, naval port on the island of Guam in the Pacific Ocean. So if you're not familiar with Guam, what you have here is a, a two-harbor system. So uh, in the top part of this image is the outer harbor. So the outer harbor is enclosed and it's connected to the Pacific Ocean uh, to, the, to the west, which you can't see in this image. And then you have this small um, entrance into the inner harbor, which is where the vessels uh, are kept, where the naval vessels are kept. So during the 2011 Japan tsunami, in this area, two nuclear submarines, the Houston and the city of Corpus Christi, broke free of their moorings. Um, these two were pulled off. Um, one of the subs damaged its rudder and had to be tugged back to port. Uh, the other one, the captain, was able to maintain control and he brought it back on his own. Now, the truly remarkable aspect of this event is the size of the waves. So you may think that you have one of the most sophisticated ports on the planet with two very sophisticated uh, naval vessels. The wave and the currents that caused this to happen must have been very significant. That was not the case. So the amplitude of the wave in the harbor of Guam was just about 30 centimeters. So a very small wave, amplitude of about one foot. Um, but yet this one foot wave was able to focus its energy and generate currents strong enough to pull these two ships off their mooring lines. So this is a, not a lesson telling you that a one-foot wave can pull all your ships off their mooring lines. What this is is a lesson saying that you need to understand in a port in a harbor where the worst currents caused by a tsunami will be. These will tend to be very localized. They will tend to um, really focus in particular areas. And so the motivation from our work, the hope of our work is that we will be able to study ports and harbors and be able to tell the captains of the port where these high risk areas are, where the focus areas are, where the areas you don't want to be are. If this information was conveyed to Guam, they would not have put these subs in that area. This is the, was probably the worst place to put the two subs. Um, and they put them there thinking that they would be protected. They did not understand their tsunami hazard. Now, if we look at these four cases of large vessels being pulled off their mooring lines, what do we see? 
there's a very clear commonality when we look at these four cases. And that commonality is that they all tended to be near corners. Why is that significant? Think about fundamental fluid mechanics. When you try to push water into a constriction, into this harbor area, it has to funnel in. And as it goes around that corner, you start to get a little bit of spin, a little bit of rotation. So if you're near that corner, and in particular, the worst case, if your vessel is sticking out a little bit past that corner, as this water starts to spin, you induce a lot of yaw in your vessel motion. That yaw leads to uneven loading of your mooring lines, which allows one line to part, which will sequentially fail through all of your lines. And so this is what we see. In the last slide, I talked about hot spots, the areas you don't want to be. These tend to be near corners in ports and harbors. These corners are just bad places to be. You have to understand that um, if you have time to remove vessels in ports and harbors, these tend to be the hot spots. This is where you want to focus. These are the first vessels that should be removed from ports and harbors. At this point, it's probably fair to say that we have a good understanding of the types of currents we see in ports and harbors and how those currents can cause damage. The next major step is to develop a model that can predict these currents. So I'll skip over much of the details, and I'll just show this one slide giving you one of the final applications of the model we developed. We applied this model again to many different cases, but one of the most uh, interesting one is to try to recreate this very large whirlpool that was caught on video from a helicopter during the 2011 Japan tsunami. So you see that animation in the video the movie in the lower left. The right plot shows predictions at the same time as the video is showing. Um, and in particular, let's focus on that image in the upper right, which is showing the velocity. So the simulation shows the eddy in about the same location, about the same size. Uh, interestingly, the animation is predicting current speeds on the order of 8 meters per second, close to 15 knots. So these are tremendous currents. The currents that are predicted in this model are fairly consistent with what you see in the video, which is white water being wrapped around the egg. So you can only get these white water types of rapids being wrapped around a whirlpool if you have very strong currents and the type of currents that are predicted in the model. So with this type of comparison and, and others, we have some confidence that we can use this model and it's a good predictor of the type of currents that we expect. Now let's use this model and try to understand some of the effects that we might see in some of the local ports. So again, we're going to look at this tsunami generated by a magnitude 9 earthquake just north of Puerto Rico, and we are going to focus on two ports. We'll focus on the port of uh, Rio Hena and port of Santo Domingo. Here again are the location of these two ports. Um, both in the area of Santo Domingo, both located at the ends of rivers. The most important component of nearshore modeling of tsunami effects is good bathymetry and good topography. In many places in the world, this simply does not exist. Um, for our two locations here, we were able to get our hands on the nautical charts, the navigation maps, um, which are not digital data ready immediately to use in models, but the data is contained. And so what you have to do with these types of maps is you have to digitize all the individual depth soundings and the contours, and you can turn that into a digital elevation model, which we will use for our simulation. Looking first again to Rio Hena, uh, this is the animation that we discussed earlier, but now let us focus much of our attention on the current field shown on the right. Um, so as this animation evolves, what you see is that the first series of waves that come in for the first 50 minutes or so of the event are all depression waves, all negative waves. They're pulling the shoreline offshore. So these waves are associated with the, uh, the depression component of the uh, earthquake and the waves that are generated in the southern port of southern part of Puerto Rico. Um, so these waves are relatively small compared to the event on the order of half a meter to a meter. But what you'll see if you look at the current field 
is as the wave is the water is being pulled out of the river with this depression wave that you still get very strong currents on the order of two to three meters per second or four to six knots being pulled out of the harbor by the time that first very large crest arrives you see water funneling up through the harbor and you see currents in excess of five meters per second uh, close to 12 knots in that area and you see these currents are widespread inside and throughout the harbor um, including the uh, container terminal area this wave forms something of a bore as it goes up the river and the bo that bore height is on the order of one to three meters depending on where you are and current speeds at the head of that bore are in the ballpark of three to four meters per second so this is a very large wave it would probably cause tremendous damage to all the areas along the banks of the river. Now let's look at the simulation results for the port of Santo Domingo. Uh, so here we see a similar situation uh, as previous. So the wave that approaches this area is going to be very similar because spatially they're quite close. Uh, so the first waves that approach are these depression waves, again, on the order of half a meter to a meter in uh, trough height, uh, followed by the large crest, which uh, arrives just about an hour after the earthquake. And what you'll see as this uh, tsunami approaches, again, similar to Rio Hena, um, because of the bathymetry at the mouth of this river um, near the port, you have quite a bit of focusing and very large wave heights approaching five meters at the port. Um, this wave energy uh, enters the, the river and travels upstream. It doesn't quite look like a bore here, more like a tsunami, but wave heights here as it travels upriver in the ballpark of two to three meters high, um, with widespread currents in excess of five meters per second. So very, very strong currents, very, very high elevations. You would expect there to be, again, significant damage to all the areas along the banks of the river. And so it's important to reiterate here um, in terms of flooding predictions. The flooding predictions overland flow are really only as good as the topography elevations that you have. And so here I suspect that the topography elevations that we have, which are taken off the nautical charts, are not very good. So this particular simulation and the previous one may not be very good indicators of flooding and inundation, simply because we likely don't have the ground elevation properly in the simulations. However, looking at the currents um, that are predicted by this model, these are likely more reasonable, assuming that the bathymetry taken from those charts is still reasonably accurate. So these the data from these charts is usually quite old, but it may still be reasonably accurate. So it's just to show you, for a large event, the types of currents that you would expect to see are well in excess of five meters per second in the port areas, probably approaching uh, six to seven meters per second. So you're looking at something like 15 knots. Very, very strong currents. And more so, not only are these currents very strong, but they're very, very dynamic. They change rapidly in space and time, uh, impossible to navigate, very easy to pull structures off mooring lines, uh, scour foundations, etc. Um, but these simulations are only a piece of the puzzle. So you, you can't go to ports and harbors and give them maps, give personal maps of fluid speeds or elevations. These aren't particularly helpful in terms of mitigation and understanding the types of potential damage. So the important component here, and something that we've been working on quite a bit, is finding ways to take these types of simulation results, maps of how fast the water might move from a given tsunami event, and trying to convert that into areas of potential damage. So how do we do this? How do we try to connect a tsunami current speed 
to some potential damage. Um, well, what we are proposing here and what we were doing in California and in some other areas on the West Coast is to come up with a damage index. So what we have done is we've looked at many observations of damage to ports and harbors um, in tsunami events around the world, and we've tried to categorize the different types of damage. And that's what you see over here on the lower left. You have these damage indices going from 0 to 5 where a damage index of zero means no damage, a damage index of one means the small nav buoys have started to move. Damage index of two is when we start to see damage to docks, to small boats and large buoys are getting moved. And then three, four, and five continue the progression to more and more damage, where three is moderate damage, four is major damage, and then five is complete destruction. Well, we can, again, look at the observations of damage to uh, marinas, ports, and harbors around the world, and we can categorize it with this damage index. We can then look at measurements of currents from these areas, and we can look at uh, simulation of currents of these areas, and we can try to plot those two together to see if there's a correlation. And that's what you see by this scatter plot over here on the right. And it gives you this pattern of what you hope, which is sort of a line increasing to the up and to the right. Um, and so now what you can say is you can look at this and you can say, well, it's not clear. There is scattered of the data, but there is visually a correlation between the current speed and the type of damage. However, we're not going to try to quantify this correlation too precisely. The approach that we will take is we're simply going to bin or categorize a few different areas of likely damage. And that is what you see over here by these colored bars. So if you look at the data, what you can see is that, generally speaking, if your current is less than two or three knots, here we're thinking in knots, uh, you don't really see much damage. As soon as you start to pass that threshold of two to three knots, you start to see minor damage, you start to see buoys move, you start to see the beginning of moderate damage. As soon as you pass to a threshold of around five to six knots, that's when you start to see the moderate damage become more common moving into higher and higher currents, when you start to pass a threshold of around eight or nine knots, that's when you start to see major damage to complete destruction. So this is how we're going to use the current speeds from the models. We're going to use them to bin areas of no damage, minor damage, moderate damage, and major damage. Now using these three bins of minor, moderate, and major damage, um, this slide gives you an example of what a tsunami hazard map might look like. So the blue colors represent minor, yellow, moderate, red, major. And what you're looking at here is a damage potential map for the port of uh, Los Angeles and Long Beach here in Southern California um, for a large tsunami generated by an earthquake in Alaska. Okay, so what you're looking at here is not currents it is potential damage. The idea being it's a much simpler metric to use, something you can look at very quickly and you can very, very easily identify where the hot spots are, where the sensitive spots are. Um, and so this is the type of product that we are putting together for ports and harbors throughout California. It will probably be adopted to some modified way in much of our Western US states. This is the type of thing you can do with models to give Port and Harbor masters or Port and Harbor personnel an idea of the bad places to be and likewise the safe places to be, right? So you can always move vessels to areas that are supposed to be safe inside your Port and Harbor um, if you don't have to move them that far. Previous analysis really focused on the strength of the currents, but as we talked about from our example in Reunion where the ship was pulled off its mooring lines the second time three hours after the first time, the duration of the currents can be just as important as their magnitude. And so this slide is showing uh, how we're trying to present this type of information with something we call a time threshold map, where this time threshold is the time interval between the arrival of the first wave to some later time after which the current does not exceed a given value, which is our threshold. So it really, it allows for an estimation of how long an event will last and the maximum possible duration of damaging currents. All right, so this image here on the right is giving an idea of how this type of time map, this duration map, is going to be presented. So this is again looking at the ports of LA and Long Beach in Southern California in the United States. Um, 
for the Japan 2011 tsunami. So this is a, a threshold map for a speed of three knots. So when you look at these colors here, what they tell you is how long three knot currents will persist for. So by the two entrances, by the two gates, what you see are these uh, orange red colors. So if you look at the color map here, which is in hours, those orange colors tell you that in those areas, a uh, current speed of three knots will last for about 45 hours after the first wave. So this is the duration. Where you see the lighter blues, these are maybe 20 to 30 hours. Okay, so this gives you the time. It's that additional dimension. Um, the other maps tell you where the maximum currents will be, what type of damage you'll expect from those maximum currents. This map gives you an idea of how long they will last. But those two pieces of information together, ports and harbors should be reasonably well prepared and can understand what they should experience during a tsunami event, both in terms of magnitude and duration. Before I finish up here, I'll talk quickly about some of the future work we're doing. Um, this animation is giving you a, a visualization of where debris may be transported during a tsunami. So the red dots are meant to represent single pieces of debris, and the green lines show you their tail over the past, the past few minutes. So how is this type of information useful? So you, you usually know where your main sources of debris are. These are going to be where your vessels are. This might be where uh, container areas get flooded and those containers get picked up and float. Um, it can be very important to understand where they will go. Will they beach themselves nearby? Will they find their way into the main channels where they may sink and block the channel? Will they migrate all the way out into the deep ocean? Um, these are all important things to at least have some idea about um, before the event happens. So you can at least plan and know uh, um, where to go to find certain debris and where to not go to avoid certain debris. Um, in addition to this type of debris transport, we're also using models to come up with sediment predictions. You know, how much will the area around your breakwaters be scoured? Where will that sediment go? Will it fill in the channels inside your harbor? Types of things where you can plan for having to do dredging and where you may need to do dredging immediately after a tsunami. And to my conclusions, my summary. So what I've tried to present here is an overview of tsunami observations in ports and harbors, the types of damage that we have seen in ports and harbors and why we see that damage. Um, that leads into developing models, which I've shown um, for some local areas, and how we use the information from these models to develop hazard maps, which is, is the goal. It's the whole point of understanding tsunamis, developing models to predict tsunamis so that we can understand them and predict them in the future, and that information can be used for mitigation, for emergency management, for planning, for engineering. With these maps, we have damage expectations, durations of strong currents. I didn't talk too much about it, but we've also come up with defensible retreat depths. Um, how far offshore do your vessels have to go for them to be safe, to be out of the way of strong currents? Right now, this information is being incorporated into what we call tsunami playbooks, which are booklets or binders, which are given to the ports throughout the state you know, for their specific bathymetry, for their specific marina layout, for a number of different scenarios. The idea being that when an earthquake happens, they know where the earthquake is, about how large it is. They can turn to a specific page in that playbook to get a very rough but quick idea of the types of effects that they may see in the coming hour, hours. And so next we're looking to develop um, this sediment uh, transport and debris transport maps. And it, all, the, all of this is working to this image that you see over here on the left. So trying to come up with a way to show which components of a harbor are at risk, which areas are safe. Um, so in this map, what you see here is it's a hypothetical map, but the red dots show the particular dock areas which are very much at risk yellow moderate risk and green is relatively safe so you bring the information from the simulations in you look at the capacity and demand ratios at all these these structural components and you can come up with a vulnerability estimate so with these vulnerability estimates you can direct future mitigations you know what to fix um, you know where to spend your money first in order to get the most uh, return on your investment this is what we're working for. This is what we hope to be able to use to make our ports and harbors more resilient to tsunamis in the future. So for any questions about the stuff I've talked about 
today or tsunamis in general, do feel free to contact me. My email is shown there. It's P-L-Y-N-E-T-T, um, just one E at usc.edu, and there is also my website. Thank you.